back on this Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. If you think there hasn't been enough scary news lately about the people uh, running our economy and so many segments of our society, consider this possibility that they're determined to reproduce at the quickest rates possible. My next guest has written a fascinating article for Insider, which is insider.com, also businessinsider.com. Uh, Julia Black is a senior correspondent there with a focus on in-depth investigations about the people and companies who are shaping our culture today. And uh, they're shaping it in a rather un unexpected way right now. So first of all, Julia, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Now, um, let's start with this. Your article uh, is about something called pronatalism. Have I got that word right? Yes, exactly. I think with this article, I'm hoping to sort of coin that term in this new context. It's obviously not a brand new word, but it's one a lot of people might not be familiar with. Pronatalism is just the idea of being supportive of increased birth rates, having lots of babies. But, you know, what I got from your story, you know, we've heard this before in other contexts, right? We've heard it, um, as you mentioned, you know, the New Zealand shooter, you know, we've heard it in an anti-immigration context. You know, we hear these very right-wing uh, tropes, old school right wing, they're trying to replace us. Uh, we won't let them. Uh, we have to have as many babies as possible to, uh, you know, to, because we're in a demographic war, population war, whatever you want to put it. But the twist on it that I got from your article was that this, this, the sense that this has now become very embedded with, you know, a lot of billionaire thinking, a lot of uh, kind of overlapping with the worlds of effective altruism and long termism and things we've been hearing about in the wake of the collapse of FTX uh, and Sam Bankman Freed. The idea that uh, if I am a certain type of person, let's say, uh, a Sam Bankman Freed type or, a, a, you know, a tech type or whatever, then I think the noblest thing I can do for humanity is have as many children as possible so that the world has the long-term opportunity had to have more people like myself uh inhabit it am, am i more or less getting that right yes yeah, so it's interesting that you bring up those kind of you will not replace us catchphrases that we've all heard in the context of the great replacement theory which is something that the alt-right really grabbed onto in like 2016 to 2018 era. Um, and that's sort of the idea that white people fear being replaced by minorities, um, that they're concerned about white birth rates dropping to a point where white people will no longer exist. This is sort of adjacent to that. And instead of white people, it's tech people, really intelligent people, really wealthy people. So they're not actually specifying that race is part of this theory for them. I think some people would argue there's a lot of overlap. Um, this is a largely white community, mm -hmm. um, especially the subject I was focusing on. But for them, it's about IQ. It's about intelligent people are being replaced by less intelligent people because of where the birth rates are distributed um, around the world. Well, and so what you're, I, I'm struggling with the best way to put this right, Julia, because so you're saying it's not overtly racist, but on the other hand, it, 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 it's it's implicitly something disturbing <laughs> to me because what you're saying is is that the people engaged in this practice are absolutely certain in their own minds that they're the best humanity has to offer, which seems to me. Uh, particularly since these the people you describe tend to be wealthier, more influential, and so on, including some of the most influential and wealthy people in our society, like Elon Musk, uh, suggests a kind of thinking that is, at best, a very contrary to democracy, for example, right? Because uh, you mentioned Peter Thiel too, you know, but but uh, uh, what you you're really saying is a group of people say. 
clearly explicitly saying we are better than you therefore we must it is our moral obligation to reproduce at a rapid rate in order to replace you am i being unfair to the adherents of this movement no i mean i think they would be the first ones to admit when pressed on it that that that's their fundamental belief that they are superior and therefore it is their responsibility to rule the rest of us and i think there are a lot of fascist undertones um, to this kind of conversation. And there's a lot of overlap, as you say, with Peter Thiel. I mean, these are the exact types of people who are pretty actively working to um, get involved in our democracy in ways that may or may not be fair uh, for the rest of us. And so I think that there is a pretty strong undercurrent of fascist thinking here. I mean, even the couple I interviewed um, and featured in my story they're naming their kids after Roman emperors. Like this is very much an idea that these kids are going to grow up and be the, I think they called it at one point, the dominant classes of the human race. So they're, they're not shy about expressing these kinds of that ideas. Caught, that caught my eye right away, Julia Black, that uh, this fam couple that you uh, profile, si Simone and Malcolm Collins, Collins. Uh, Torsten Titan Invictus, who is uh, uh, his sister, um, and Octavian, his brother. Uh, and you write this, uh, Julia Black, you write, according to his parents' ca calculations, meaning the children's, of course, as long as each of their descendants commit can commit to having at least eight children for just 11 generations, the Collins bloodline will eventually outnumber the current human population if they succeed malcolm continued quote we could set the future of our species you know for people who are convinced that their brilliance is what humanity needs i mean any college statistics class can teach you about the perils of of uh you know multiplying over you know if 0.01% of our population becomes 0.02% of our population, it will be 300% of our population. You know, I mean, this is the kind of thing you're, you're, you're taught very early on in rigorous analysis not to make such foolish assumptions. And yet they say this, I mean, you were there, I was not, but they appear to say this with a total lack of self-consciousness and they didn't seem self-conscious with you about their kids names or the assumptions behind their thinking uh were they as convinced of their own superiority as they seem you know they they will sometimes make jokes about some of their ideas you know at one point they started talking about one of our many side crazies and started talking about sending a a micro biome environment to Mars to turn Mars green, like they do have a certain understanding that these ideas are pretty far fetched. But at the same time, they ran the calculations, they budgeted out their turn Mars green plan, like they're pretty serious about them, even if they say it with a bit of tongue in cheek attitude. And I think that's the same logic that applies to the eight times eight times eight times eight across 11 generations. Like, I, I think there's some part of them that really does believe that that's feasible, which is yeah, it's it's pretty wild to have those conversations face to face and um, try to gauge exactly how serious they are. But but they're very committed people and they have pretty much devoted their lives to this project. Well, you know, the other uh, before we go into their thinking a little more, the other thing that struck me about it was and I'll admit, you know, my uh, my then wife and I had two children, zero population growth was what people were talking about then, right? Uh, two of us, two of them. Um, but uh, it seems to me uh, that you have children out of love. You don't have children out of ideological commitment. I hope they love these kids. I hope for the sake of the kids that everybody involved with this movement loves their children, but it worries me a little bit when you see your children as a miss mission rather than human beings you're sharing your life with. Do you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. I mean, I, having spent some time in their home, I will say they demonstrated a lot of love for their children. I don't believe they're going to be monsters as parents, but it will be really interesting to track these children's lives. As you say, they have been turned into a science experiment. So we'll see how they feel about that. And and to their credit, the Collinses 
consider that all part of the experiment. They they will be tracking their kids um, progress over time. They expect some of them to sort of defect from this community they're building. And they're all they're going to be compiling all this data into this long term science experiment. So it's yeah, it's it's a wild household. I will say that's what I would I'm speaking about the Collinses specifically. Elon Musk, I think his treatment of his children is perhaps a different story. I mean, we've seen his daughter become completely alienated from him. Um, that was one of the stories that came out this past spring. His transgender daughter has basically said, I want nothing to do with my father. And um, yeah, I think I think he's had a strange relationship with his children, his many, many children. And uh, I think some people would argue that he's not paying a lot of attention to them and might see them more as projects. So uh, let me, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the philosophy itself, uh, pronatalism or whatever you call it. You say that uh, uh, it's a theory that Elon Musk has championed on, on his Twitter feed. Ross Duthat in the New York Times uh, defended it. Joe Rogan and Mark Andreessen, who's the billionaire venture capitalist, bantered about it. Uh, you mentioned the white supremacists and so on. Uh, but uh, and also that a spate of new assisted reproductive technology startups are coming and so on. Um, but I don't, again, I, I guess, well, let's start with this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm struggling because it, it, it unexpectedly for myself because it's just so wild. But um, do you think there's a lot of overlap? It strikes me there might be between this and what they call long-termism and effective altruism, the idea that, that the best way to help human beings of the future is to make calculations now and then act accordingly and project forward. Is that where this comes from, you think? Yeah, 100%. There's a lot of overlap between the EA and long-termist community and pronatalists. Um, pronatalism has become increasingly a topic of conversation among those types. And, you know, there's there's various ways that they look at the, the very distant future and how they might save it. Uh, but there's a lot of apocalyptic thinking spreading in Silicon Valley right now. Um, a lot of terror around AI. Um, artificial general intelligence reaching such a point that it surpasses humans and takes over the world. Uh, they talk about asteroid strikes. Weirdly, the one very real issue no one seems very concerned with is climate change. You would think that as a long-termist, um, the very real threat of climate change in future generations would be a top concern, but it's kind of out of vogue at the moment. It's it's much more these kind of sci-fi threats to humanity that they're interested in. And, and yeah, they're having these very serious conversations about um, technological innovation stalling as a result of population decline. So that's how they connect the two things is we're going to stop coming up with technologies that can save humanity. And so we need super intelligent babies to become those. Yeah, you mentioned at one point, one of the thinkers saying that, uh, and I think it was an effective altruism, one of the advocates there saying, well, we need, we'll have fewer humans, so they have to be smarter to basically at the gist of it. But it seems to me also that without being a Luddite about it, that there's a kind of tech worship here. And which fits with the idea, uh, and also from my own reading, about why they don't care that much about climate change anymore, as if they just assume, well, there'll be some geoengineering hack that will come up with that will go away. But but the super intelligent computer that wants to turn us all into paper clips is, you know, is something more concrete to be concerned about. I, I guess what also uh, concerns me about this is there's, besides the worship of technology, there's a worship of abstract intelligence. You know, we're told there are so many different forms of intelligence, emotional intelligence and, and you know, that kind of thing, but strictly um, a kind of technocratic number shuffling. And, you know, I, I'm just wondering what happens when one of these kids says, she wants to be a woodworker, you know, or uh, he wants to play the guitar or whatever, y y you know, that they may say, no, 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 you've got to save humanity. And I'm wondering, for some people, I think the best way to save humanity is by being a woodworker or playing the guitar. But it, it, it seems that these are going to be tiger 
you know, technological tiger parents uh, driving this. Um, what's your sense of that? Yeah, I mean, you bring up a couple interesting points that I actually did want to touch on. One is this like emotional intelligence aspect. I think mm -hmm. we're watching this play out with Elon Musk in the news so much. And so many people are watching his leadership and there's just this lack of EQ, you know, like right. his own employees. Are, he's ruthless. It, it's he's displaying this real, real lack of empathy and kind of a misunderstanding of what it is that humans want and what we get out of life and what makes life rich and worth living. And so I think there's a little bit of a fear of if we're engineering so much towards these very, this very strict definition of intelligence, which might just be the ability to invent things, we're missing a big part of emotional intelligence and the kind of thinking that actually is, you know, directed at how to make humanity happier and more thriving. So there's that. And then the other part is a very significant part of this whole story, which is just this idea of genetic engineering, which is really factoring into right. the pronatalism. And so there are new technologies actually developing as we speak, and then some that are a little farther off, but really kind of scary to think about um, that will allow parents to change the type of kid they have. I mean, we've all heard of designer babies, seen movies like Gattaca, there's a lot of sci-fi visions of this future, but some of it's actually kind of starting to come true. Um, so that's that's one really interesting element is um, trying to make choices based on what they believe the genetics of their children will look like um, and picking and choosing the ones that they think are best for humanity and playing God. I mean, a lot of ethical questions there. Sure, including if you start, if you do start, and of course we've, this has been a debating point for many years now, but if, if if the technology is really advancing, if you do start, if wealthy and powerful people start biologically enhancing their children in some ways to succeed in a society where they are the people de determining the terms of success, then you really risk a kind of uh, biologically reinforced class system that i hate to think about yeah I mean, again to go back to the way they reference the roman empire like if inequality isn't bad enough right now what happens when we introduce these technologies that some people i spoke to for my story were kind of talking about like introducing the ultimate driver of inequality like rich kids from the moment they're born already have a set of advantages what if we introduce advantages before they're even right. born? We're, you know, making them the healthiest possible babies. There is, to be fair, a lot of debate within the genomics community about just how much genetics determine intelligence. That's sure, later, of course, yeah, yeah. Helping on that, but for the sake of argument, let's say that it's true. You can genetically edit a baby to be better, smarter. Yeah. What if we're only doing that for this tiny 0.01 percent? It's it's Gattaca. <laughs> it's straight out of sci-fi. Yeah. Um, and even if you can't, uh, you, there's a great paragraph, Julia Black, in your um, in your article, and I just want to make sure that I, I've got it right. Yeah. Okay. So you describe, uh, and obviously this one couple, you know, I'm sure there's a diversity of personalities involved in this group, but uh, you describe her as Simone, as statuesque, even one month shy of her delivery date wearing and i quote her pregnancy uniform of a crisp white oxford shirt a long black skirt doc martens and red red lipstick uh, ignoring she would later tell me her mother-in-law is pleased not to dress like an effing pilgrim in front of the press their wardrobes simone told me later are meticulously curated to protect the kind of gravitas their work requires between their thick black rim glasses the couple looked as they put it quote unquote, biologically young, uh, it's merely an editorial comment on my part. I would literally die before I would curate myself <laughs> in this fashion. And it made me wonder to what extent, not only they, but the people involved in this aren't, for lack of a better or more uh, psychologically professional sounding term if they aren't just control freaks you know it, it, in other words you get to be a billy you get to be elon musk or peter thiel 
by having out of control ambition and desire to control and gain and manipulate. And, uh, you know, I don't know about the couple and what their background is precisely, but, but I wonder if this isn't just like another manifestation of a, 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 an over controlling personality. Uh, what do you think? It's funny that you sort of fixate on the outfit aspect because that's actually it's like almost a cliche at this point in tech you know steve jobs kind of started it with the black turtleneck um elizabeth holmes famously had her red lipstick black turtleneck again um so i do think that there's something to that this is uh an image control issue within tech specifically um yeah again just for the types of people the the collinses are the best characters i ever could have asked for <laughs> i mean for one, I do have to give them a lot of credit for their transparency because this is such a secretive movement. It is not something that Elon Musk is eager to hop on the phone with me to talk about. Um, so I was, I, I really did have to give them credit for letting me into their world, being so open about their ideas, even knowing how they would mm -hmm. be perceived. Um, so grateful, grateful for that as a writer, certainly. Um, but yeah, I mean, just watching the way that they curate and organize their lives. Um, they have systems for everything. Um, you know, even Simone actually measures out her food before she eats it. It's it's a very technical lifestyle and, again, gives you some insight into the types of minds that are that are shaping our future and and what they value and and how they how they see the world. Um, really fascinating people. <laughs> well, they seem to be. Um, but let's go back to, uh, and you're absolutely right, it's to their credit. I'm sure they've gotten uh, a little bit of grief over this. Uh, now, l l let's go back to some of the little, the philosophical dimensions of this. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, you mentioned uh most people i know have zero to one or or one kid uh you know the richer he's saying the richer people are fewer children they have but musk wound up uh, well, echoing an argument made by nick bostrom one of the founding fathers of long-termism who wrote that he was worried declining fertility among quote-unquote intellectually talented individuals could lead to the demise of a quota boat advanced civilization excuse me advanced civilized society this of course being the premise of the movie idiocracy but um emil torres a, a former long-termist philosopher said quote the long-termist view itself implies that really rich that really comma people in rich countries matter more now it, it, it's interesting to me because uh obviously first of all when we say pronatalist the people who are part of the pronatalist movement are pronatalists for themselves they're not pronatalists for people in africa or for people in south america or for people in or for people on the other side of town the town they live in necessarily right so uh there is that but it seems to me it's odd because effective altruism also has you know you shouldn't help your neighbor when for the same money you can buy a thousand uh, malaria nets and save a thousand people so it seems to me there's a there's a kind of ambiguity towards the world's uh less fortunate people where they matter less but they can be inputs in some kind of calculation it all strikes me as rather uh odd what do you th yeah um, you get what I'm driving at, though, that it, it's kind of like they can't perceive the people who aren't, quote unquote, like them as truly human. So, so at times they mathematically calculate the maximum number of them that you can help. But at other times they say, well, to really help humanity, we're the ones that matter. Then they seem to me like two sides of the same coin, meaning that in neither case are they seeing people unlike themselves as fully realized human beings yeah so there's a couple of aspects to that that i would address one is um the couple i interviewed the collinses call themselves secular calvinists um i don't know how familiar your audience is with calvinism i won't go too deep into it but uh as a religion one of its 
core tenets is this idea of predestination, which basically is the argument that at birth, each of us is assigned a role by God, and you're either kind of a chosen one or you're not chosen to be saved. And then any success you have in life or lack of success is a manifestation of that de destiny. So what this boils down to for people like the Collinses or for Elon Musk, um, who is also known to be sort of a proponent of this theory, is if you're super rich, if you are the richest person in the world, that is a direct reflection of your superiority. That doesn't, it's not an accident. It's not luck. It is, you were born better. You are better. You live better. You're going to heaven. <laughs> like, it's just this destiny that you have. And so the flip side of that is that if you're poor and destitute and, you know, living in hell somewhere, you kind of deserve it. And right. so, you know, one of the alarming things about this theory is like, you just pick certain people who aren't going to be saved. And it's not, you know, it's not worth trying to save them. It's not a big evangelizing community. They're not going out to seek people out to be saved. They just believe, okay, you're either saved or you're not, and your life and how it looks is proof of that. So that's that's a pretty alarming core tenet to hold if, if this is the kind of um, stuff you're getting involved in, uh, because it is that idea that some people are just inherently better and deserve more, and we can live with that. Then <laughs> the other aspect I wanted to address is you're talking about looking at people as numbers and data and just, you know, one in a billion or trillion, as it were. One thing in the effective altruism movement um, is this idea that the more lives, the better, period. The more human lives or human adjacent, as they might turn out to be in the future, um, that's inherently a good thing. So <laughs> this idea of long-termism and effective altruism is all about protecting not the 8 billion people who now live on earth, but the potential trillions and trillions, I can't even tell you how many zeros they add to this number of lives that could theoretically exist in the future and including not only human flesh and blood lives, but consciousness that's been uploaded onto a chip and is floating around space somewhere. So really, <laughs> this stuff is not about feeding your neighbor. It's not about, you know, going and volunteering at a homeless shelter. It's about saying, ah, my real responsibility is to protect trillions and trillions of microchips, uploaded brains floating around space trillions of years in the future. It's so abstract that it, yeah, it becomes entirely impossible to care about your neighbor. It's it's a really good point you've made. And of course, as, as, as people have pointed out, if you truly believe you're acting in the interests of trillions of hypothetical humans and other intelligences in the far future, uh, killing somebody is a small price to pay to ensure the well-being of those trillions and killing a billion people is a small price to pay to ensure the well-being of those trillions. Uh, Julia, I'm so glad you focused on the phrase secular Calvinist, though, first of all, because I saw it in the piece, but it, and I know what a Calvinist is, but it didn't sink in that, you know, in fact, oh, you, it's predetermined. You're, you're, your fate has been decided. It doesn't matter what you want to do or what you, you know what you uh, what you think you can choose to do including being saved or living by living a virtuous life or whatever no it's done and and the the upshot of all that for me is you know i was concerned about these people before i brought you on the show uh now i'm really worried because these this is a group with a lot of power a lot of influence a lot of wealth and um also, I think nuts because uh, because you know the idea that you can stake uh, that you think you're sane and brilliant by creating radical hypotheticals and making moral judgments based on them is I mean it's like me driving blindfolded towards a brick wall and thinking, well, I'm really, my family's really smart. Somebody will figure out, uh, you know, how to invent brakes before we hit it. You know, it, it's just, it, it's detached from, it, 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 you know, as they used to say in my hometown, it ain't right. You know, somebody ain't right in the head to do this. I, I, I don't know. That's just my feeling. But, uh, you know, what was your feeling writing this story? Were you worried? Were you intrigued? Were you what? Um, <laughs> I'm 
definitely scared. I'm pretty scared for the future for a number of reasons. Um, I think one we touched on earlier is the lack of interest in democracy among some of these very powerful groups um, and watching our democracy already be so under threat. Um, I think it's pretty concerning that people with this much power are having ideas like this. Um, another, I'll come back to climate change again. I mean, one of the biggest defenses I hear of Elon Musk is, oh, he's he's the guy who made the electric car cool. He's our greatest hope for solving climate change. Um, and kind of my response to that is like, yeah, wouldn't it be great if he focused on that? Um, and instead, I think he has a lot of people whispering in his ear, giving him these kind of crazy radical ideas. And what you see on this daily basis is he's completely distracted. He's moving in a million directions at once. And sure, I think it'd be pretty great if he focused on renewable energy. Um, maybe he is smart enough to save us all from climate change, which I personally see as our greatest threat right now. Um, so I do think it's a shame to kind of distract from issues like that, um, which effective altruism really has has moved in that direction. Um, yeah, and again, just, just the idea that some people um, would believe that they deserve to rule the rest of us uh, based on their superiority. That's that's alarming. <laughs> and it fits with the work of people that are popular in the Silicon Valley, like economist Tyler Cohen, who, you know, basically postulates that like it or not, 85% of the population will have no, in this country, will eventually have no uh, or no way to contribute to society, so they should just just be kept pacified. And the fifteen percent who are above average, who are exceptional, will have lives and jobs. And of those, you, you, you know, so it does fit with a very dystopian view of the future, doesn't it? Yeah, and I guess one last thing I would add that alarms me is the same thing that alarms a lot of these people. So they say, um, which is AI risk. I I think we're watching it unfold this week. There have been some pretty dramatic advances in AI capabilities this week. And it's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. But I think what's weird and confusing about it is it's the very same people who are talking about how, I mean, it sounds like you're familiar with the paperclip maximizer. Yeah, I am. Idea that yeah, you know, sure. Be programmed to turn us all into paper clips. It's the same people who have those crazy ideas about what AI might do to end the world. But they're also the same people who are developing it and training it. And so OpenAI, which is something Elon Musk co-founded, is a chief example of this. They're, they're these AI alarmists on one hand. A lot of people within that community talk about AI taking over the world. But simultaneously, they're developing it. So and I'll, I'll <laughs> add one and then I'll let you go, Julia Black, which is they are also acting like out of control ai themselves they're using a kind of uh you know uh algorithmic form of thinking to reach decisions that are dangerous for humanity which is exactly what they're frightened about with uh out of control ai so it's almost like they've become the thing they fear uh, they seem like AI to me, more like real people, more than real people in terms of their actions and their behaviors. So, but I've kept you too long and I'm sorry about that, but the, it's a fascinating article. Again, my guest is Julia Black and the article in insider.com, billionaires like Elon Musk want to save civilizations by having tons of genetically superior kids inside the movement to take control of human evolution. So thanks for writing it, Ju uh, Julia, and uh, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, it was a great conversation. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.